uh, this has been a fabulous day so far, and I hope I'm going to offer what I hope is a complimentary perspective um, from the other side of the the uh, the aisle here. So uh, here's the the quick outline. Um, the the frame for this entire day is imagination of market, and I think that's a useful frame, and I want to offer a complimentary one. So um, imagination of market has benefits. Uh, I think that's a useful approach, um, and I'm going to suggest that thinking about markets before imag you know and as markets as a way of sort of generating imagination imagination regarding robots could be useful I'm going to do that through a specific um, just a run through of a 14 month study that I did of a robotic telepresence system uh, I wasn't intending to focus in in the way that I did here I just got lots of data about this topic um, and the punchline is that um, I think that as far as I've experienced the robotics community, which is to say not very much, so I want to label this as uh, pretty tentative, there's a lot of focus on instrumental value that robots provide, sort of helping with tasks, accomplishing things in the world. Um, and I think they also, in, in fact, I think we've seen in some of the talks today, that they also serve as potent symbols and as signals. Um, uh, sometimes independent of their instrumental value, but often these things are interdependent. So there's the punchline if you want one up front. Uh, and I would say, as I, I just mentioned before, this is not what I intended to study when I went and did this study. So um, these are sort of uh, bleeding edge musings, if you want to label them that way. So, so take them with a grain of salt. Okay, so here's what I, this is my crass sort of rewording of what I take to be the sort of MO uh, in robotics and maybe engineering generally, which is you can build some cool stuff, so go do it. Uh, the, the, in terms of the history of the discipline, you know, maybe some people will buy it. That would be good. Um, either they'll have money to give us to help us build it more, or, the, you know, God for, forbid people will buy Roombas or something like that. Um, this is, the, I would say, the most recent variant, which I think Rod Brooks is a big proponent of, which is build it, and while you build it, test it, and lots of surprising things will happen. Customers and users will do interesting things with them, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. It's a feature, not a bug. To pay attention, gather data, uh, and learn. Um, and so there's the, the quick summary of that. I think that's, I, I'm going to cast no aspersions on that approach at all. It's the kind of thing that built the pyramids and Harvard and all the and MIT. Uh, it's all fine, valuable, and good, except uh, Kate, uh, and I think Kate did mention this basically, um, we could take serious issue with this approach um, uh, in many ways, and I, in fact, um, have, I do that a bit myself and enjoy those kinds of conversations, but my intention here is to say, there's a lot of good that comes from that approach, and I think um, it sort of presumes the individual or small collective or even large collective these days of entrepreneurs or um, engineers creating something and bringing it to a market to learn about it rather than learning some things about markets and then designing accordingly. Um, so uh, instead of... or uh, I want to propose that, maybe not instead of, but in addition to expecting market surprises, there's a lot of research that I've been forced to become familiar with through my doctoral education, and some of which um, I've gone and sought myself, that describes how markets work as social systems. Uh, and that if, uh, as roboticists as, and, and sort of cross-disciplinary groups, we come to become familiar with that research, it can help us anticipate how markets will react to robots and to robotic systems. And I study, situ as Sabine mentioned, I study situated use of robotic systems, and I'm a sociologist, right? So there are economists who focus on these questions. So you're going to get a budding sociologist slice uh, on this phenomenon. And uh, this is, uh, you, you can tell I'm a, I'm a fan of caveats. Th uh, this is inductive qualitative work. So I'm intending to suggest rather, and this work wasn't even focused in this direction, so um, it's really suggestive. Um, so I'm not going to talk about these areas, but there is, these are just the areas that I am familiar with where there is good research on how markets will react and, and how markets behave, a market being a place where people exchange services or goods for, for value. Um, there's, and, and, in, and we may talk about this in the panel later, but robotics are, is moving aggressively into a number of markets that resemble the kind of markets for, say, IT or, um, you know, physical product in these areas. You know, robotics are becoming platforms, software, hardware platforms, open source. There's a premium thing going on, cloud computing. 
there's good research on how these markets work. Uh, and I don't hear the talk about that research uh, in my interactions with roboticists. Um, and I would suggest, by the way, that for those of you who are interested in funding, getting VC funding or, or DARPA funding, there's a lot of research on how those markets work. In other words, what it is that leads to funding being acquired, and sometimes what it is that leads funding not to be acquired. Um, so, as a way of getting at these questions, I'm going to get to that study I mentioned. So, uh, this is a study that I uh, completed a while back. This is, uh, and I tend to do my um, data collection analysis through uh, basically observing work. But this is uh, at a 387 bed hospital in the northeastern US. It's a reasonable sized place. Uh, and it has several ICUs and several satellite locations with referral relationships to community hospitals. And in, the two, in 2008, the COO leased 10 RP7 units. Without me going to my next slide, how many of you know what an RP7 is? It's a sizable percentage. OK, so quickly, uh, RP7 is, uh, as of 2008, was the state of the art uh, system for use in medical settings. Two-way audio and video, two degrees of freedom head. It's essentially. Uh, that's the sort of Skype on wheels portion. It has a private audio jack on the back. You can speak to a physician remotely about what your ailment is or what have you, or with a nurse. It has a little printer, a stethoscope. It runs on Wi-Fi. It's got holonomic wheels, et cetera. Um, initially, this was intended for stroke diagnosis, remote stroke diagnosis. So if you had a, a community hospital that couldn't afford a neurologist on staff, you would place one of these units there, and then you would um, have a neurologist from a, a larger hospital beam in through this robot to do stroke diagnosis because in order to do stroke diagnosis, all you essentially need is visual data. So pupil dilation is key. And diagnosis, when it happens really early and quick, can make for a quick uh, decision in terms of which drug to administer. And by the way, if you choose the wrong drug, it's usually fatal. And the right drug saves the person's life. So it's a strong use case in the beginning. So quick show of hands. How many people think this is a robot, just out of curiosity? How many strongly feel that this is not a robot? OK, how many aren't sure? OK, how many don't care? <laughs> um, I, yeah, it wasn't salient to this study. Um, so uh, the method, basically, is I stay there for 14 months, 10 months intensively, and that was on the night shift in uh, one of these ICUs, just watching how it was used, uh, and, and taking timestamp data on verbatim exactly what people said when they were using it. It was also a controlled study, so the prior practice for checking on patients at night was the senior attending would call in via phone and speak to a medical student and ask them how all the patients were doing. The uh, experimental condition was uh, no, labeling it experimental conditions a little bit of a stretch, but they, uh, they would use this robot via cu a custom laptop and drive around the unit and check on all the patients with the resident in tow and speak with the nurse. Um, and so I, uh, in, and I interviewed people about their reactions and thoughts about using it and so on, their hopes for the future. Um, so this is the person who's in charge of the program associated with these robots. I'm not a fan of reading quotations to audiences. Ouch. Right. Um, OK, so this is what was supposed to happen at Hopeland. Uh, the COO arrived, insisted that robotic telepresence was the wave of the future in medical care, and the hospital should acquire the state-of-the-art equipment. This I got off the web. Um, Although I should say I've modified some details along the way here so that if you wanted to go Google that phrase, you're not going to find it. Um, so, and the plan was, um, per spec basically, to, to place these in small, smaller hospitals so they could do ro remote diagnosis. Um, and the goal for the main hospital was to deploy their expertise more efficiently, right? Because if I can do a bunch of remote diagnoses, I don't have to physically go to these places. Um, and they took possession of 10 of them in 2008. This was before I arrived. And this is what actually happened. So phase one, you have a mid-level level administrator in the hospital who was assigned that director role. This is the first quote that you saw up there. Then 2008 happened. Uh, you may remember 2008. Um, and they, this person managed to put a unit in the Bahamas and two at rural facilities and placed five of them in the hospital itself. 
In other words, within the same building. Okay? Uh, and three were in plywood cases in storage in the hospital. Do you want me to read these to you? No. How about you just take a read? Yeah. Funny how it worked out. Yeah. Wasn't the plan. Yeah. This is what happened. Um, they couldn't place them at these remote hospitals, the emote, be, partially because there was this crisis, and these remote hospitals said that they couldn't afford them anymore. Because the hospital had to pay for the cross charge of the service. Not only that, they had to host the robot. Um, there were other reasons as well. So, phase two, it got even worse. So uh, four of those local units and one of the remote units were boxed up and put into storage. Uh, so <laughs> this one I, I have to read out loud. It's too much fun. So the senior hospital administrators told him, this is this guy I'm quoting, out of sight, out of mind, and I was told, get him out of the hospital because they sat plugged in. They weren't being used for the longest time. People knew we were spending a lot of money on these things. People were asking for FTEs, full-time employees, and people were getting shot down for this and that, and they were saying, well, you're paying for the freaking robot, and you tell me no. So they were like, get him the hell out of there. Right, box them up, put them in a closet. Uh, and this uh, VP at a rural hospital, he said, get these the hell out of here. Apparently that's the, the preferred phrase because whenever promotions or raises came up, they couldn't give them out, times were tight, and people would say, oh, you have money for this damn thing and you can't give me a raise, the hell with you, right? And so now I've got that in the closet too, it's terrible, okay? So this is what I arrived to. So this is one of these units in a closet, stuff behind some stuff here. These are a few, and this, these are all in a closet as well. Um, just here's the gory detail. Hadn't been used for a couple years, this one. Uh, these had been moved from closet to closet. And this right here is, uh, this is actually was recently cleaned, but they generally had a thick layer of dust on them, the ones that were out in the unit. And by the way, this is in a hermetically sealed post-surgical ICU, sickest patients in the hospital. So for it to have a thick layer of dust on it is quite significant. Um, okay. So uh, thought of one way, this entire story up to now is an abysmal failure. Ten units, and how many are left? Anybody doing the math? There's at least one, right? There's one in the Bahamas, right? One in another rural hospital and one remaining in this hospital. Three out of ten. And the rest of them are in closets. So I'm going to put it to you that... Uh, that's a fine and useful way to think about it, uh, for especially for an organization. And I would also say that these robots were delivering value for this organization and for even the employees, uh, regardless of the status of their use. And this is that symbol and signal bit. I'm going to head there now. Uh, but before I do, I want to describe the study that I did do, which is with one, the one robot that was still sitting there. Um, so, as I said, it was a, a comparative study with the phone. Basically, the, the practice was let's touch base with our page, about our patients at 9 p.m. And there was randomization for 10 months. And this is a separate paper. Uh, this is a paper that's actually just headed off to a journal now. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about the findings of what we learned, basically comparing phone and robot. Um, you can see folks t let, enjoyed taking... This is basically the unit was parked... Uh, the RP7 unit was parked right here, plugged in at night. And it would drive around the unit. This is a patient room right here. The doors were sealed. A resident, one of these people, would follow the unit over here. The, they would check on the patient, talk with the nurse, and so on. Um, the phone practice was the, the, this resident would sit at a desk tethered to a landline and talk with the senior doc about the patients in the abstract. Um, so uh, here's some quick data on how I think this, and I wasn't seeking this data. Uh, people just wanted to talk about it. So uh, this is the attending physician who runs the unit. Uh, we recently had an engineer here, old guy, 91-year-old patient. He was recovering. He was sitting in the chair, and he was very bright, so I just surprised him. I drove the robot in. He was so happy, and he was so amazed, and I knew that he would love it. I wanted to engage him positively and motivate him. You know, he had, had brain surgery. Uh, and these, these are uh, transcripts from, I can type, pretty close to verbatim conversations. So, um, this is a nurse and a family member. She, the nurse comes to me and is like, um, this guy's following the robot around. And, and the family member's like, how cool is that? Hey, Dad, it's like short. And this killed me, by the way. Johnny 2? Clearly, they, they've got their number. Right, Johnny 5, come on. But anyway, this guy was so excited that he, he, lost, he lost three digits. 
Um, so, uh, you know, and, and nurses, and this, these are pretty representative. So nurses and second nurses, before the robot would approach a patient, they would say, hey, you're going to talk to a robot. This is pretty cool, pretty amazing. The attending would, you know, start the conversation. And patients were pretty, overall, quite enamored, especially families, actually. Most of these patients were either sedated or, or uh, just sometimes not quite with it. So I think this robot was delivering uh, uh, value as a symbol and a signal. So signal, a uh, term often used in economics, is basically uh, information that's costly to fake that you share to elicit confidence, trust, or garner legitimacy. Legitimacy is usually the thing that... Um, that, uh, and, and this is the basic message uh, behind a signal. Like, you can trust me. Banks invest a lot in marble for their facades. You can trust us, right? Because it costs a lot for us to get this marble here. Um, and in, in, in many ways, this uh, robot served as a signal that this organization was committed to healthcare. Um, and to good healthcare. It's also, I, and this is from sociology and anthropology, a symbol, I think, which is. And uh, this is, if this one was a stretch, this is a super stretch, but I, um, you can see it in the quotes for yourself, you judge for yourself. Basically, this is an assurance that all is as it should be, or if it's a symbol to the contrary, it reminds us of how things should be, or how the world is. Um, and the, the, I can supply more references, but this is, these, co these concepts have been dis deployed in analysis of other kinds of social systems, and I think it applies to robotics in particular. So. Um, I, I didn't want to leave you with the impression that these signals and symbols were always ple uh, present or positive. So here's a negative one. This is, a, this is the sort of big brother theme. People were always wondering if it's on. I feel like it's hidden camera. It's going to see me. I'm going to swear like a dirty dog and it's going to pick it up. It's going to be on permanent record. Right? And the thing was shut off. The camera would be down. It wasn't capturing data, but often it was covered with a sheet, for example. Um, so a sim it was a uh, symbol of surveillance. Um, and then, it, you know, there's some people who said, nah, I never really cared about that robot. It didn't really bother me. So it's not as if it was always salient. And the same here. You know, it wears off. Skype on wheels. So those things could all be true, too. Um, so like I said, this was not the focus of my study. So I take it with a grain of salt. I encourage you to do the same. But I... I, I am, my working theory is that robots help us achieve three interdependent aims. So productivity is clear, uh, achieving outcomes in the world, but also securing legitimacy, legitimacy in what I'm going to call existential security, which is the sort of things are the way they should be. And in my case, productivity, it allows people with a lot of expertise to deploy it in a high fidelity way and to learn about a remote environment in a high fidelity way and to participate with other people who have expertise. So it compared to this phone, which by the way, the phone, the way the phone would work is that if you were this senior doc and you called me, you'd say, how's bed one? I say, good. You say, okay, bed two. It was very quick. Or um, I would tell you how bed one was doing, and you had no or limited way to verify or decry what it is, the claims that I've been making. And I'm in training. I have maybe one or two years of clinical experience, you have maybe 30, and the nurses around me have maybe 15 on average. So it's a literal game of telephone that's going on. So there's some significant potential productivity gains. Um, but in terms of legitimacy, I, I could have shared many slides with you um, where people spoke frequently, and I did not ask them about this, about how it made them feel like they were at a cutting edge institution, uh, either as patients, or as the, the staff in particular, like, wow, we have this robot, and we're not even in downtown New York. Um, so, and, and this had the effect of attracting students and patients. So families, uh, and this is anecdotal information, but families would leave the ICU. I could hear them talking amongst each other. Did you see that robot? This place is really high tech. This place is, right? Um, and uh, uh, students as well. So there were medical students peppered throughout this institution as a teaching hospital. And once this study began, this randomized study, the word got out very quickly that this thing was on and everybody wanted to know, is it a robot night? Because they wanted to take selfies. Right? <laughs> right? Or they would come in and they'd be like, this is wicked, man. I want to get down in the ICU. This is so awesome. And, there, and I should say, on the flip side, there were others who said, um, you know, this is a symbol, this is a sign to me that this place is going downhill. Can we not get a doctor here? 
Is that what this is telling? You know, so it's, it's not as if it cut all in one direction. But in general, during this study, it seemed to cut in that direction. And uh, this is, I, I think, also by leasing 10 of these units and only using three, still showed that this hospital, this institution, was willing to put money towards saving lives, right? Because it allows us to do remote diagnosis, but also maximize the use and the development of the professional skill of people that were there. If you can get us all together in a virtual conversation, we're going to be more capable. And using your expertise and deploying it and improving it in the world is one of the core tenets of Western society. That is one of the things that makes us feel like we are functional participants in society. So that has value independent of whether we're actually doing something beneficial. That's, how, that's my current way of thinking about it. If you disagree, so be it. That's fine. But I think that this robot served as a strong symbol that we here are committed to expertise and maximizing the deployment of expertise. That's why we're wasting money on this. That's why we're willing to throw money at 10 of these robots and only use three. Um, part of the story, not the entire story. Um, so uh, some reflections on this, and this is not a paper. This is just my thinking about this data. So it seems more tightly coupled, um, by the way, they, uh, these meaning um, the symbolic and the signaling and the productivity um, value that robots uh, delivered in this setting. They seem more tightly coupled at the level of work and less at the market level because you can signal to the market that you're a cutting edge institution by buying the robots, but you never have to show that you are using them. They can sit in a closet. Or you can even just put it on your website that you bought them and they haven't even been delivered yet. And that has signaling value to the market all by itself. Right, so just saying you're associated with robots. I could go out, leave here today and say I presented at, right, and I may not I may not have, but that still can have signaling value. But the more you observe me, you can find out, was I here? Right? And at the level of work on the ground, it's harder to fake. It's harder to separate these out. But for an organization, it's not as hard. And I think these interdependencies between symboling, uh, symbolic and signaling value and instrumental value matter more as interpretation uh, and key outcomes become strongly linked. So Cynthia spoke about healthcare. Uh, that's a place where, and, and I, I spent some time here too, where my reaction to how I'm being treated, my, my view of this, what kind of place is this that I'm being treated at, or what kind of place am I working at, has an, a demonstrable, or can have a demonstrable effect on the care that is provided. In other words, if I'm a happier patient, I might do better. And I might be happier if I'm a 91-year-old engineer, and I think this is a cutting institution, and I just had an experience with the telepresence robot. So it's uh, not obvious to me that these are entirely separable. I think in some cases, when interpretation is more kind of at the core of what's going on, these things are going to become more salient. Um, in my case, I, am, I, do, I want to make a very bounded set of generalizations here. So you have large urban academic hospitals and smaller community hospitals. Oh, this is nicely lopped off. Sorry about that. So um, competitive and legitimacy pressers at, at uh, this kind of institution are going to be low and high at smaller community hospitals. So uh, robotic system, uh, this, is, this should say novel robotic system purchasing frequency. But anyway, if, a, a new robot sort of unproven system, it seems to me, because this kind of institution has lower need for establishing its legitimacy and lower need for sort of reinforcing everyone's uh, understanding of how the world works, is going to take less, less risk. It doesn't need to signal or show symbols as much as this kind of place, which has more to lose. Um, my dissertation is on the Da Vinci, the surgical robot, the, the forearm surgical robot. And there are many, many smaller community hospitals that are purchasing robots with uh, higher frequency, spending more of their proportional budget than large hospitals on this system. Um, and the, their motivation, so for a large institution that doesn't really have a need to secure legitimacy or to, um, to, to sort of reinstate the social order, would be looking for efficiency gains from these kind of robots and would therefore adhere more conservatively to the specs, right? We'll just use it for what it's for. If our goal is legitimacy, so in, I think that was at play at, at this previous institution I described, um, you're going to be looking for legitimacy to a greater degree, and therefore, let's find ways that we can use this system in multiple uh, ways, um, but maybe we don't have to actually use it, we just have to advertise that we use it. Or we have to show that it's part of who we are. We have a telemedicine program. 
So there are a number of institutions that I've informally checked in with who also have a number of these units boxed up, but their website has a telemedicine page on it. Um, and there are many large institutions that have a good number of these things placed in hospitals, and they don't make a, they have a telemedicine page also. Um, but relatively speaking, it seems less salient. Again, this is just my impression at this point. Okay, so uh, this is, I, I suppose, a take home. I think these things, um, we often focus on how, what we can build and what it can do in the world. Uh, and I shouldn't say we, actually, so I'm not, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I'll say you, right, if, if you're an engineer. Um, as in so far as I have experienced the community so far, there's a lot of focus on technical achievement and then find a way to get money from it. Uh, when it may be that robots, their prime value in a given social context uh, or a given organization may not be the thing that it ostensibly does uh, or achieves vis-a-vis -vis sort of a, an objective outcome. It's much more that it delivers value for us in terms of it reinforcing social order or making us feel like I know what a human is and it's not that. Or I'm not sure what a human is and that's really cool and maybe, you know, um, it is that too. So there's a symbol and then there's, you know, we buy robots. You know, Google just bought and continues to buy lots of robotics companies. And it seems to me that I'm sure they have productivity uh, outcomes in mind. They, they'd be crazy not to. But it seems to me that these two things are at play as well, right? They, they want to signal that they're a certain kind of company. Um, again, this is just me standing up in front of the room deciding that that's how I feel about that. No, no data about that at all. Um, questions? I think I'm basically out of time. Reactions?